good day to my fellow poetry enthusiasts, and welcome to our analysis of The Zula Girl by Roy Campbell. We've got an image here of our poet of the day, Roy Campbell, enjoying a lighter moment in life. Here's some basic information to allow you to get insight into his life. Now, Campbell attended Kersney College in Durban. Thereafter, he headed off to Oxford University. Whilst many consider him to be an Oxford man, he actually failed the entrance examination. He told his father that the university lectures didn't quite align with his goals, which dealt mainly with poetry, and thus a year later he left for London. He married Mary Margaret Garman, and they had two daughters together. Campbell's poetry is known to be a little controversial, and this came to the forefront when he responded and attacked several groups due to his wife's lesbian affair. Despite this, he is considered to be one of the best poets of the period between the First and Second World War by T.S. Eliot, Dylan Thomas, Edith Sitwell, and several other famous names. Now, the lack of a university education certainly did not hinder his adventures, and thus his social commentary is unparalleled in many ways, and you'll find that as we dive into the Zool Girl. And here is our poem, comprising of five stanzas in total. Looking at form and structure, firstly, you'll find that we have a pretty consistent rhyme scheme going on. It's going A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D, and that continues throughout the poem. And the different stanzas are thus related to each other, and they are linked and binded through this consistent rhyme scheme. Let's open up our senses as we break down the Zulu girl stanza by stanza. Let's get started, shall we? Before we head into stanza one, let's have a look at our title, the Zulu girl. Now, the Zulu were once a very powerful tribe in South Africa, so this already implies that we're looking at the African setting. And then we see girl. The Zulu girl, so it's just referring to any person of the female gender, not really giving that person much respect or importance here. When in the hot sun the red acres smolder. Now we're getting a lot of words here that imply heat, and I'm gonna highlight those for us in red. So in stanza one, it's the hot up here, very obvious one. There's sun, there's red, this is the color of heat. The smolder, sweating also alludes to a sense of heat. So now we come to the understanding that we are in a very hot, rural setting. And the color red is representative of the African earth, the soil. In our very first line, we also get our first metaphor of the poem, and that comes right at the end of the line with the smolder aspect. I'm going to mark out all our parts of speech in red, if you don't mind. And that is a metaphor, because the land is being compared to a fire that burns without flame, such as when, you know, you just see hot coals that are glowing with different shades of amber. Now, this can burst into flames at any time. It, it's quite volatile. It's quite a danger to the people in its surrounds. So similarly, the land is so hot that at any given time, it might just burst into flames. Looking at the next line, down where the sweating gang its labor plies. Sweating again brings up that imagery of an unbearably hot environment. There's extreme physical labor um, involved it also stirs up a sense of sympathy in the reader towards this girl working on the land and this group that we have here. Now, instead of seeing group, however, we see the word gang. And this is a very interesting diction here being used. It really suggests that the workers have no individuality and identity and they're being treated like Nameless laborers, they are being forced into this work, they have no personal pride or pleasure in doing this, there's no sense of satisfaction or achievement that comes from it, and they're really being lumped together in this sort of group of rebelliousness. A girl flings down her hoe and from her shoulder, 
So again we see a girl. She's being referred to as a girl despite her being an adult. It's pretty impersonal. It's, it's showing very much a lack of prominence. And this is really a consequence of apartheid where people of the African nation were not afforded much respect. And also the word, again, girl, resonates with our title. Flings. She doesn't just throw it down or toss it down. She doesn't drop it. The word flings is really giving us this, this impression that there's a lot of impatience, there's defiance in her actions, and she does not wish to be subservient to the authority that is controlling her. Her ho, her ho, again, okay, that implies that she's working in a field, she's harvesting, and from her shoulder unslings her child, tormented by flies. Unslings is used as a powerful sound device, now she unslings her child because she carries her child on her back while she's working. So this shows that she's forced to look after her child herself, despite, you know, this labor being so intense. She has no choice but to bring him along. Even this little child is tormented by the flies, which shows that even the youth, even the innocent, suffer in this situation due to the powers that be. Looking at the stanza as a whole, the tone coming through here is one of repressed anger and really a sense of anguish. The stanza is synonymous with the oppression of the people. Moving on to stanza 2, we come up with line 5. She takes him to a ring of shadow pooled. So a ring implies that there's very little shade, it's, it's very small space that is sheltered off from the sun. There's really no escape from this heat. Pooled is again interesting use of diction and there's quite a bit of irony to that because pooled is usually associated with water and quite a cooling effect and that contrasts greatly with the image of heat but ironically there is really no escape from this heat. By the thorn tree purpled with the blood of ticks. So this thorn tree again, this shows us our setting, our African rural setting. And usually the thorn trees were used for the ticks and fleas to be rubbed off onto. And here these trees are providing a bit of shade as well. It says that it has become purple with the blood of ticks. So this implies very unsanitary conditions. It's really unhygienic. The area has become purpled with this blood because there is such a gross amount of ticks and it emphasizes the poverty and the harsh conditions of the laborers. While her sharp nails in slow caresses ruled. So amidst all the squalor, we are seeing an image of a strong, protective mother. Her sharp nails, they've been deliberately sharpened to enable her to kill these ticks quite effectively and quickly, you know, otherwise they could be quite harmful to her child. She has no other way or means of dealing with this issue. In slow caresses, this is showing a softer side of the mother. It's showing care and love, despite her life throwing so many obstacles in her way despite the difficulty of it all, she still cares deeply. Ruled is, is really describing that this is a systematic movement of her hands. She's quite methodical about it. She's quite practiced. Movements are deft as she kills off these ticks with her nails. Line 8. Prowl through his hair with sharp electric clicks. Quite a few uh, parts of speech coming through here, quite important ones as well. Starting off with the very first word, we have a metaphor coming up here. Now, here her fingers are like a fierce animal that is searching through the forest for its prey. The way she searches for the ticks is compared to this savage animal searching for its prey. It's pretty methodical, it's with purpose. Through his hair with sharp electric clicks. Now, down on this end as well. Firstly, electric clicks. Clicks gives us 
lovely sound device known as onomatopoeia. In addition to this being also a metaphor. So the sound of the ticks being killed are compared to the sound of electric spark. This sound is produced when she finds a tick and she cracks it between her fingernails. It's quite a savage crushing and it gives off that sound of an electric spark that just zings something potentially to death as well. Now looking at that last line, what we find with the sound there is that you first get quite long, drawn out, kind of softer sounds like prowl, I'm going to mark this off really quickly, like prowl, it's a longer, soft sound, hey. And then we reach words like sharp and clicks, that paces up quite a bit and that changes the dynamic of that final sentence. On the whole, we see a sense of deep love coming through and there's really a tone of nurturing in stanza two. Note that it is suggested Campbell intended to identify the women with natural phenomenon by remarking on the similarity between thorns and her sharp nails, which we found here in lines six to seven. This theme will come through further in the poem, so stick with me for stanza three. We've made it to stanza three. His sleepy mouth plugged by the heavy nipple. The sleepy mouth is referencing the sheer exhaustion the child experiences, and this is due to the very difficult conditions uh, to which he's exposed. Plugged by the heavy nipple, meaning, you know, the nipple is very full. There's a lot of nourishment in there, and the fact that his mouth is plugged indicates the child is very small, so this heavy nipple just fits into his mouth. Moving on to line 10, tugs like a puppy, grunting as he feeds. So right here we have a simile. He's being compared to a puppy. Now, the child is compared to a puppy because of the manner in which he's feeding. It's a very greedy manner. It's, it's very much animal-like. Also, what comes through is the fact that the child being compared to a puppy means, effectively, that the mother is like a dog. So again, this dehumanizing of the girl comes through. This image of a parent tenderly feeding their child will be reminiscent of something positive, something like the Virgin and Child painting by Raphael. And in this case, however, it's quite contrary. It's quite a negative view. This mother is being compared instead to an animal. And so this really drives home effectively the negative manner in which the people in the poem are viewed and the utter dehumanization of this tribe. Further, granting is also part of speech of importance. This is known as onomatopoeia. And this description, again, adds to this animal quality of the boy and the mother. Here he is. Actually, too young to be able to speak and express his feelings, so instead of voicing his satisfaction, he is simply grunting. And again, this underlines how he's greedily feeding on his mother. Through his frail nerves, her own deep languors ripple. Now, here, the frail nerves, the child is very much irritable, of course, because of the tough conditions which he's experiencing. Langers refers to tenderness, so the mother's tenderness is flowing through to the child and the child is really expressing how the mother feels. Her deep tiredness and low energy flow through to her child, like a broad river sighing through the reeds. Again, another simile, and sighing. We get more onomatopoeia coming through lovely sound devices. So, here this simile, the milk is flowing from the mother to the child, and this is compared to a river that flows slowly, and the sound sighing of the water as it moves through the reeds represents the satisfaction of this baby. 
A river now is usually associated with sustenance. So not only does this child take in physical nourishment, but he also feels safe and protected in his mother's arms. This image is quite effective because the oppressed, as you will find, are hungry for freedom and justice. They are not quenched or satisfied quite yet. So this stanza really foreshadows democracy, the time when they will all be nourished and satisfied and feel quite safe as the boy is in this case. Stanza 4. Let's do lines 13 and 14 together. Yet in that drowsy stream his flesh imbibes an old, unquenched, unsmotherable heat. So yet indicates that it's not only the mother's languors that the child is absorbing, he's taking in much more. And if you see here, an all unquenched, unsmotherable. Again, this is almost like going back to our imagery of heat. Except here, this image of a creek displays that the child absorbs the strength of the Zulu nation. There is lost pride and knowledge of the Zulu warrior spirit still present in his genes. And he's taking in all of this. Here you'll notice quite the change from stanza 3 to 4. Um, in stanza 3, we encounter the child feeding greedily and he was grunting with satisfaction. It was quite a strong physical image. And now in lines 11 to 14, there's a lot more psychological calmness. The mother is more calm, perhaps because of this unsmotherable heat. The curbed ferocity of beaten tribes, the sullen dignity of their defeat. So, who are the beaten tribes? This refers to the African tribes that were forced into submission during the colonial times. And you can still see that they've had this sullen dignity. Despite their current oppression, they are still ferocious and they still keep their heads held up high. There's quite a sense of resentment here, deep-rooted resentment. There's repression. Her tribes, though curbed and beaten, still maintain their self-respect. Here you'll notice a change of tone. So initially in this stanza we had harmony and languor, and now there's violence and aggression. And if you look up here, you'll see the curbed ferocity of beaten tribes. Those are very hard sounds. And this indicates aggression, referring to words like unquenchable and unsmotherable, portray Zulu men who cannot be stopped. They've got courage, they've got zeal, and nothing can block this energy. In effect, the Zulu girl is becoming a symbol of something more powerful. There's a change now. She's no longer just one singular girl. We are looking at the tribe as a whole. On to our final stanza for today. Her body looms above him like a hill. So up here we've obviously got a simile, a little comparison. The mother standing over a child is compared to a huge hill that protects a village. She's much more stronger and imposing than she was at the very beginning when we met her in the field. She's now representing the mother of all oppressed children. She's shading and protecting this village that breeds the future generation that is going to be their key to freedom. Within whose shade a village lies at rest. So again, she's protecting this village and they were lying at rest. Now this is quite prophetic of some looming co confrontation and a change. Here you'll see this hill and you see this shade and you see this cloud all pretty much natural elements with which the mother is being associated. It says, within whose shade a village lies at rest. So the village is being protected by this mother. She's an imposing figure right now. She's no longer just some single exploited laborer in the remote areas harvesting um, in the heat. She's so much more. She's ready to battle and survive. She is breeding a future generation. And so this lying at rest aspect really comes across as being prophetic of some looming confrontation. It becomes a little more ominous down here, doesn't it? 
or the first cloud so terrible and still. Now this is, of course, a metaphor, and the mother is now becoming a cloud. One cannot predict when a storm will arrive, and in that same vein, it will be the same with this woman and her tribe. They are gathering strength. They are building up with their younger children. And one day, they will unleash a huge storm on the people, which will bring change. I'm going to go to the next line. That bears the coming harvest in its breast. A very key word. So what we see is the cloud is terrible and still, suggesting violent storms are coming but with the prospect of a welcome harvest. Now this harvest right here is very important, as I said, because it represents their freedom. That is the harvest. The harvest from this cloud will be freedom from oppression. There's a revolution coming from the breast of this woman. The tribe will be able to reclaim their dignity. The life-giving storm which must come at the end of a hot afternoon is given all the ferocity of a zoo uprising. The uprising is subtly foreshadowed and is made to seem as natural and as inevitable as the storm. There is a promise that there will be a time when oppression will end and democracy will reign in South Africa. Looking at the flow of this poem, what we get is some changes in the imagery. Initially, you're seeing this imagery of intense heat, and that's a bit of a lazy atmosphere. Then we go to quite a sense of satisfaction when the child is feeding. So that's a little more harmonious, there's satisfaction in it. And then that imagery changes to impending doom and this impending rebellion which is a lot more ominous. At the end, we almost feel a sense of fear. There is a threatening tone coming across to show evolution which is on the horizon. And we end off with the knowledge that the children of the oppressed people will one day reap the harvest of their suffering. And that's it for this one. Show us your poetic passion and spirit by hitting that thumbs up and subscribing. I'll see you next time.